One of the things I appreciate most about being a Christian is having a type of confidence that I don't see a whole lot in the world in which we live today. I mean, whenever I watch the news, I'm sure just as you do, uh, you wonder what in the world is wrong with the world. And I know this is not the first time you've heard this, and I know it's not the first time you've talked about it, but being a Christian has given us something that the world really doesn't understand and too often we don't appreciate because the Lord loves us and has made precious promises to us and he's promised not to ever leave us or to forsake us and he has promised to be there with us and he has told us and commanded us to come boldly to his throne. As a matter of fact, God almost sounds insulted sometimes when the Lord wants us to know, as the Holy Spirit inspired, God saying, if you know how to give your children good gifts, if you don't mind me paraphrasing, what makes you think I don't know how to give my children good gifts? And basically what God is saying is you're too worried, and you're too worried about too many things, and that there are some things that you need to uh, let go, and you most certainly need to be assured and happy about being my child. I'm so glad to be here at this church where, that I have learned to love the leaders and the elders and deacons and your fine minister and his family and other ministers in the congregation because every time I come here, I see a spirit that encourages me and uplifts me because of what you believe and your tradition of service to the Lord for so many years. All of us, we've been through stuff. All of us have. If you're a child of God, God lets us know that we're going to go through stuff. If you are righteous, if you are holy, if you are steadfast, if you are one of those individuals who tries to do the best you can for the Lord, all that live godly will suffer persecutions. You see, these are not themes and mottos and cute sayings and marketing tools these are the words of God that are supposed to give us comfort and make us feel good about being children of God. Because there are a lot of people right now who are anxious, and our country is evolving or devolving right in front of our eyes, isn't it? We're seeing things and hearing things that those of us who uh, wear the hoary head or the crown of gray hair, that when we look at the world, we wonder what is happening because we see things that we thought we would never see. We hear things that we thought we would never hear. We, we watch laws change. We see the Supreme Court make decisions. We see our Congress and our Senate and our elected leaders make decisions that just boggle the mind that you can make such decisions. So where do we stand as Christians, as children of God? as people who claim to know the truth and stand for the truth and will die for the truth. Where do we stand? We stand where God told us to stand. That's where we stand. We stand for him, we stand through him, and we stand with him. The Apostle Paul understood that, brothers and sisters, and he, he told us our job, God didn't send us to invade. He didn't send us to attack. He didn't send us to, uh, uh, a, a team to go out and, and recon and, and then set up traps and booby traps and IUDs. And that he didn't, that's not, the disputed territory has already been won. The victory has already been attained. The Lord is already king. His kingdom is already set up. Heaven is already our home. Victory is already our gift. And since the Lord has already given us this, then we have to ask ourselves, then, Lord, what is it you need me to do? Well, he gave us our standing orders, and all of you military men and women in this room know what that means. It simply means that you know what you're supposed to do. If you're supposed to make a stand, that means you're standing on and for territory or a hill or a valley or a fort or a building or a position that has already been won, fought for, and won, and you don't want to lose it back. What the Lord told us to do is stand, 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 stand. 
Don't buckle, don't quit, don't compromise, don't give up, don't run, don't capitulate, don't negotiate. In, in essence, the world has nothing to give us. There's nothing to talk about. All our job is to do is to preach what the Lord told us to preach. Paul wanted the church at Ephesus to understand this, and with no apologies and, and with no remorse, he gave them and told them what God intended for them to do. After Paul had talked about the ways and attitudes and character of believers, he had talked about how to raise our children and how husbands and wives need to fortify themselves because of their attachment to their God and Father in heaven, then the Apostle Paul, as he concludes that letter, he tells the brethren, finally, brethren. In other words, let's wrap all of this up. Finally, let's draw the line. Finally, brethren, what have we learned? Finally, brethren, where are we now? Paul understood what was going on in Ephesus. I'm sure your minister, your fine, well-taught minister has told you about the Temple of Diana, that was in Ephesus where there were all types of debauchery and, and heathenism and nudity and all types of terrible things that were going on in the temple of Diana. I'm sure that you understand from studying that city in the, in the Rome, as a Roman province, many of the things that were accepted in Rome. And the saying that even lasts today over 2,000 years later when in Rome do as the Romans do. Well, that's what a whole lot of people were doing at that particular time. But right there in Ephesus, in the middle of all of that debauchery and sin, Paul gave the Christians their orders. Finally, let me tell you what you're supposed to do in the middle of all of this foolishness. In the middle of all the lies, in the middle of all the sin, the corruption, the perversion, let me tell you what you're supposed to be. And many times as Christians, that's what we forget. We allow the devil to get in our heads and tell us a lie. That's why the Lord told us as the Apostle Paul who was beaten and whipped and caned and stoned and snake bit and shipwrecked, this old beaten up uh, uh, disciple, this old evangelist, this apostle, this old preacher whose body probably is bent and turned and broken and healed wrong. You can't get hit with stones as hard as Paul was hit without breaking some bones. And he didn't have doctors to set his bone. We know Luke was a good guy and a good physician, but nothing like what we have today. So it's no telling what Paul looked like. It's no telling how he walked. I walked pretty bad because of my old bad hip, but it's no telling how Paul looked and walked when he stood up to speak. But his words were strong, and that's what counted. And his words to the church were resolute, and that's what counted. His courage was clear, and that's what counted. His commitment was obvious, and that's what counted. And when Paul talked to our brethren, yes, these are your brothers and sisters who just happened to live a few centuries ago, when Paul talked to our brothers and sisters in this church of which we are all members of and all of us trying to go to the same place so we can meet some of those folks at Ephesus and Philippi and Colossae in the Galatian region, those that lived at Rome and other places where the churches have been established by Paul's missionary journeys and Peter's preaching and others preaching. We're trying to get to the same heaven they're going to. We hope to meet them on the cloud one day when the Lord calls the church, calls our name, and I hope I hear my name. I, I intend to hear mine and meet him on the cloud. You know why? Because the Apostle Paul says, don't y'all get all caught up in all the stuff going on around you. Don't sit in front of the news and, and look at those commentators and the talk show hosts making stupid jokes and the rich women who've got the power to control the minds of people and their morality, you don't get caught up in that. You preach the gospel. You stand for the truth. And you don't waver, and you don't change your attitude and trust in God because of the foolishness that they say. This is the reason why the Apostle Paul told the brethren he preached to that every one of you in this room can quote, when I start it, you know you can finish it. 
Paul said, we walk by what? We walk by faith. And not by what? Not by sight. In essence, we don't walk by fact. Folks say, fact is, y'all outnumbered. Fact is, we got bigger buildings than you got. Fact is, we got satellites in outer space and we can shoot our stuff all over the whole planet in a matter of minutes. Fact is, we got internet networks and we've got preachers with super jets that we buy so we can send them all. Fact is, y'all are outnumbered, outclassed, outspent, outbuilt. Y'all just an irrelevant little bunch of folks who claim nobody's going to heaven but you. And how many of us have gotten caught up in their rhetoric, their marketing tools, their lies, and we allow it to make us step back and drop our heads because you know what? They're right. That's why Paul said, you don't walk by fact. You walk by faith. Because who would have thought that a little old boy from Nazareth, and can anything good come from Nazareth? Come on now. We don't we know his mama? Don't we know his daddy? Wasn't his daddy that carpenter guy? And this mama, that woman with a house full of children down there? Don't we know them? Did, did, where did this boy get learning? This boy wasn't educated at the feet of Gamaliel like Saul of Tarshish. He didn't go to the University of Tarshish like Saul. That's just some little old boy that just got the basic education at the synagogue. What if Jesus had listened to people? What if he had allowed them to write his story, define his character, set the tone of his future? He didn't do it. What Jesus did was what God sent him to do. I came to do the will of him that sent me. I've got to work while it is light because when the night cometh, no man can work. I can do nothing of myself but I came to do the will of him that sent me. In the golden text of the Bible, Jesus said it out of his own mouth and he gave his standing orders as well as his mission and as well as God's reasoning for sending him in the first place. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have life. Out of the Lord's own mouth, he gives the comforting words that every one of us as Christians ought to quote to ourselves every day. I have been blessed to know the truth. I have been blessed to know my father. I have been blessed to know my redeemer, my savior. I have been blessed to become part of his family. I am blessed to change my citizenship because my citizenship is in heaven. I am just a pilgrim passing through. This is a colony of heaven. Just as the colonists came over from England and France and other parts of Europe and came to these shores and colonized these shores, we're just a colony of heaven. We're down here until the time comes that we go home where our true and real citizenship is. So when the Apostle Paul looked at the totality of the things that the church was suffering, when he looked at the martyrdom that was rampant, when he saw men and women being placed in the Colosseum of Rome and in other various arenas about the empire, when he saw animals, when he saw lions disemboweling little children and women for the sport of Roman citizens who were thrown bread and passed out wine so that they could be in a drunken stupor as they watched blood run like water for their entertainment. The Apostle Paul is saying, don't look at those facts. It don't take long to die. He didn't say you weren't going to die because he knew he was going to die. But he said, don't you concentrate on that. It don't take long to die. But after death comes the judgment. After death, someone who said and had David say it in such beautiful words years before you were born, though you walk through the valleys of the shadows of death, I will fear no evil because thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. When I look at the news, I don't get all upset. I don't get all worried. 
Oh, Lord, it's going to all come to an end because God is in control. Always has been, always will be. What God asks us to do is to be responsible. You be responsible to my word, to my doctrine, to my teaching, to my people, to my little children, to those who wear the years of battle who have fought for many years. You be responsible and do what I tell you to do. And if you do this, I'll control the rest. You do what you're supposed to do if you fight. The Lord has always said, here's the deal, church. If you fight, I'll fight for you and I'll fight with you. When you retreat and you give up, when you compromise, when you capitulate, when you turn your back on the battle, and the battle is a stand, the Lord is saying, I'll turn my back on you because you turn. If you confess me before men, that means that when it's time to come and it's not conducive to your job and your profession and your friends and your colleagues, there are times when myself and Sister Sheila Butt and others that we're sitting there by ourselves saying stuff that nobody wants to hear, but we say it anyway. And we let them know that there are those who do not agree with you and will not compromise for anything you have to offer. But you don't have anything to offer me that's as great as what the Lord has promised me. My Lord told me when he looked at Peter, and I'll mention this again in the sermon, when he looked at Peter and the others and saw their fears and their fallacies and their faults and their fantasies and their flaws and their failures, he didn't rebuke them soundly like he could have. You know what the Lord did? He said, it's going to be okay. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. The Lord had just told Peter he was going to deny him. He said, before the rooster crow, you're going to deny me three times. And then he comes right back there in the 14th chapter of John, right after telling Peter this. And you can't you see the stress on Peter's face? I'm going to, I, no, I'm, I'm not going to do it, Lord. I, I just can't see myself doing that. Can you see the stress on that good man's face? God knows, because God knows the beginning of your life and the end of your life. He can see it. He knows every word you're going to say and every deed you're going to do. He does not violate your free moral agency, but he's still God, omnipotent, omnificent, and omnipresent. So can't you see our brother Peter and the stress on his face? I know I would be stressed out. If the Son of God told me that I was going to deny him, and that, that Greek word means to disown, that I was going to disown him before the rooster crowed, and I was going to do it three times, I, I know I would be stressed because I've watched this guy raise dead people, open blind eyes, make feet that have never made a footprint in their life, get up and walk and skip and jump. So I know he knows what he's talking about. I would be stressed out too, wouldn't you? And what the Lord said to Peter is, I can fix you. I can fix you. You're going to mess up, but I can fix you. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. You trust God. You need to trust me also because I can fix you. When you get through with your failures, when you understand yourself better than you do right now, when you realize your weaknesses and you take control of those weaknesses, when you accept your fears and you determine those fears will never make me fall again, then you'll stop being troubled and you'll start believing in me. Because in my father's house are many rooms, many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. What is the Lord saying to us, church? To us in 2018, with all the atrocities, with the genocide that we're seeing happening right now in, in this nation, where we pride ourselves on so many things, but there are more pregnant women in China right now than the entire population of the United States. Let me tell you that again. 
That's a startling statistic. There are more pregnant women in China, pregnant women in China right now than the entire population of the United States. So while we are destroying our heritage and our future, they're preparing for theirs and they have a hundred year plan. It's time for us to do what Paul said. While others are destroying themselves and their posterity, what Paul said to the brethren in verses 10 of chapter 6. Paul said, finally, he said, come on, let's draw the line. Let's be sensible. Let's be sober. Let's open our eyes. Let's open our hearts. Let's accept these facts. All the terrible things that we know are happening in the Roman Empire. Now, what are we going to do about it? He said, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. He didn't say just be strong. Peter was strong. He had grabbed the sword and cut a man's ear off. Lord said, put that thing down, boy. You don't know what you're doing. You're not a swordsman. You're a fisherman. So he said, you're going to die by that thing. You put that away and pick the ear up and put the ear back on the man. That's not what the Lord needs us to do. He don't need us to grab swords and go and burn down City Hall and the Supreme Court, although we would love to. That's not the way he operates. The weapons of his warfare are not carnal, and he tells us this. What does he want us to use? Spiritual weapons. That's why he said, be strong in the Lord. When you look the devil dead in his old mean, no count red eyes and let him know, I'm not afraid of you and I'm not going another further. As my daddy used to say, I'm not going back anymore. We're going to save these children. We're going to save these families. We're going to take care of the Lord's church. We're going to preach the gospel. We're going to uphold this book. You can call it an old, out of style, bronze age book all you want to. We're still going to preach it. We're going to worship every Lord's day. We're going to remember his death on the cross. We're going to sing praises to his name. We're going to approach his, him on the throne in prayer. We're going to give as we prosper. And we're going to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And there is nothing you can do to stop us. That's what Christians do. That's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, be strong in the Lord. It's not your strength. It's his strength. Paul says, I can do all things through who? Through Christ, which strengthens me. And when we allow ourselves what the Lord needed, he didn't need Peter to grab a sword and start slinging it wildly, trying to cut the man's head off and cut his ear off. He don't need us to do that. What the Lord needed Peter to do was drop his hands, look the Romans dead, the, the Jewish army, the high priest soldiers dead in the eye, and say, I'm with him, and I'm not running, and I'm not compromising. If you kill him, you got to kill me too. Don't you know if the Lord sees that type of courage and that type of strength, he will embolden you and protect you and make your enemies your footstool. Oh no, America's not gone if we stand. America won't be destroyed if we stand. God told Abraham, you find 10. Lord, what if I find 50? Couldn't find 50. Lord, what if I find 40? Couldn't find 40. Lord, what if I find 30? Couldn't find 30. Lord, what, what if I find 20? Couldn't find 20. Well, what, <laughs> Lord, what if I find 10? Lord, say, you know what, Abraham? You act like I hadn't already looked over Sodom and Gomorrah. I know everybody down there. I know the hairs on the head. I know exactly what they're thinking. I know exactly how they live. If you think you know something I don't know, you go on and you find me 10 and I won't destroy the cities. What Abraham found out is what all of us should find out. God already knows. And when he couldn't find them, that was the death knell of those twin cities. When God looks down here, he needs to see East Hill, say, okay, there they are, there they are. He needs to look down and say, Coleman Avenue, uh-huh, there they are. And different churches strode throughout this nation, where on this hour, every Sunday, folks come together and they sing praises to the Lord. And they give reverence to his name and they study his word 
and they fellowship with one another, and they strengthen and uphold each other. Paul said, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And then he told us something. He said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, against the wiles of the devil. When Paul talks about this, he's saying the devil is a liar, he's a crook, he's a juggler, he's a schemer. And that's what he's saying. The, the devil wants to look at you and figure out, let me see now, what is she afraid of? What is he afraid of? What's his greatest fear? What's her greatest fear? What is it that he doesn't want to lose? What is it that she, in other words, the devil is trying to figure out a way to your mind, your heart, your spiritual heart, so that he can control you. That's what Paul says, the wiles, the schemes. The Lord didn't talk a whole lot about the devil. You've heard me say this before, and I know, <clears throat> and I know you've heard others say it. The Lord didn't talk a lot about the devil. What he said was, the devil is a liar. Once he said that, why, talk, why say anything else? He's a liar. And that's what the Lord wanted us to know <clears throat> about the devil, that the devil is a liar. Paul said, here's the deal, brothers. In the very next verse, in verses 12, Paul said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Paul said, Bubba, Leroy, Cockroach, and Skillet are not your enemies. All those folks doing all that stupid stuff are not your enemies. He says, the one that's controlling them with his schemes, his lies, and his juggling, that's the enemy. And we have to destroy the influence of the devil by upholding <coughs> the cross of Christ. The Lord said, excuse me, <clears throat> the Lord said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. That's a promise. The Lord said, if you uphold me and lift me up, then I will change things. So Paul said, our job is therefore to stand, to stand. And then look at the verses 13. Wherefore, Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Paul uses two terms concurrently. Stand, withstand. Stand, withstand. The Lord said if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. But like any other enemy, as you military folks know, just because the enemy withdraws and retreats, he's coming back. What he does is withdraw to see where your weaknesses are, where your strengths are, where your fortifications are, and then try to figure out how to breach those and how to break down those barriers and to overcome you. And that's what the devil is going to do. So he uses stand, withstand. You stand when the devil tempts you. You stand. When he shows you his lies, you stand when he tries to make you <coughs> retreat and compromise. And when, he, when you win that battle, understand that there's another battle that is coming. Then the apostle Paul, one time Paul was, was chained to a Roman soldier. I think for about two years, wasn't it, Brother Burns? That about two years, he was chained to a Roman soldier. Can you imagine having some man chained to you during the points of your most private and intimate moments and all day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you've got someone that is controlling your life, your body, and every movement that you make. So Paul understood the Roman legions. Paul was a Roman citizen. Paul was educated in the University of Tarshish. Paul was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. Paul used illusions of the games and of races and, and others. Here Paul says, fortify yourself and put on the armor. The Roman legions conquered the world and ruled the world for 500 years because they had the best metal and they had a double-edged sword and they trained with that sword eight hours a day. 
A Roman soldier was the best trained, best outfitted, had the best gear, the best sword, the best shoes. They had sandals that had spikes like football spikes. And once they put those sandals on, they would put their feet and they would make their stand. They had a shield that was over five feet tall. The thing was heavy because it had a wood base and it was covered in fur and they would dip it in water so that when the flaming arrows were shot, they could put those shields and form a wall and put out the fiery darts of the enemy or the arrows that were set on fire of the enemies. They would move forward with their javelins in unison. And the Roman army was so well trained, so well outfitted that nobody could stand against them. They conquered Germania, they conquered different areas where folks were fierce warriors and fierce fighters, but the Romans were so well trained. Don't you know that the Roman Empire failed? You know why it failed? A whole bunch of reasons. Nobody just came in and conquered Rome. Rome had to become weak, weak with sin and debauchery, the soldiers retired. They didn't want their sons to fight. They would send servants that they had conquered, slaves that they had conquered, to fight in their place. These people didn't have an allegiance to Rome. Their armor that had been so famous, they said the helmet was too heavy. So they had a little cap that replaced that helmet that covered the back of their neck so that a sword couldn't cut their head and covered the side of their face so that the sword couldn't cut their face. They made the breastplate smaller because they said it was too heavy. They made the shield a little round shield uh, rather than that huge heavy shield where they had to lift weights and strengthen themselves to carry it. They laid down the double-edged sword that Paul even used to talk about the gospel, a two-edged sword. They got a little, little knife instead and laid that sword down. In other words, they said the armor was too heavy. So they took off their armor. While they were taking off their armor, their enemies were copying their armor. While they were changing their helmet, their enemy was styling that same helmet. While they were laying down their shields, their enemies were devising that same shield for their armies. When they were laying down their swords, their enemy had learned how to make an equivalent to that Roman sword because they weakened themselves from the inside, from the inside their enemy were able to come in from the outside. Isn't that what we hear right now in America? That the, the, the armor is too heavy? Nobody really wants to preach the truth. It's too hard to raise children a certain way. Marriage, traditional marriage, is just too hard to accomplish and maintain. Haven't, isn't that what we're hearing in America right now? That the armor is too heavy? The job is too hard. The enemy is too strong. The sacrifices are too great. And we see our nation that was built under God where now we're trying to take in God we trust off of our money. We've already taken prayer out of the schools. We're trying to take under God out of the Pledge of Allegiance. We're removing religious symbols that are in public because somebody says they offend me. And we see a nation in an evolution. The only thing that stops it is Christians making a stand. We stand. We stand. We say this is what we believe. This is why we believe it and we will not alter from it. So the Apostle Paul said to the brethren, after telling them to take the helmet of salvation in verses 17, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, Paul says, here's what you guys need to be doing. Praying always with all prayer and supplications, ask God to supply in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance, and supplication for all the saints. And as the Apostle Paul said, you need to stick together 
You need to pray together. You need to work together. You need to fight together. When the church began, one of the most beautiful things that was said right there in Acts chapter 2, and subsequently again in Acts chapter 4, and this theme was repeated over and over and over in the book of Acts as Luke records those acts of the apostles. All that believed were together and had all things in common. We as Christians all over the world need to understand that you're public enemy number one. Whether or not you want to accept it, you're the last man standing. Everybody else has already sold out, compromised, capitulated, and given up so that they can keep their religious business on the right track. You're the last ones that are saying that no, you have a little boy and a little girl and God sets that gender. When they're born in the world, they are a boy and a girl. Right now, everybody else is saying a person can make a decision and that gender can be assigned. You're the last ones who are saying that marriage is between a man and a woman. You're the ones who are saying that the Bible is still relevant. So when folks come after you, you've got to do what the Apostle Paul said do. You've got to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, stand, and you may be able to withstand. Paul said something in Romans chapter 8 and verses 28 that I think that we need to take to heart. Paul said, and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord or love God, to them who are called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus didn't give up. Jesus didn't quit. He took those 39 licks. He took every one of them, his body compromised, his clothing removed, and laid over a scourging post with that whip that is one of the most ugly and torturous inventions ever made that pulled plugs out of his body, that exposed his spine, that punctured his organs, and he still took that fight. And he still took that whooping, and he would not quit. Because if the devil can make him die on the scourging post, you and I have no salvation. He's got to make it to that cross. And can you see him gritting his teeth and calling upon every bit of strength and fortitude that he had to push himself back up when they thought they had him, when they thought lick 20 or lick 25 or lick number 30, a lick number 35 had him when he went down to his knees. But he found the strength to stand back up again. This is the same one that told the devil three times, no, 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 you don't live by bread alone. No, I'm not going to just satisfy my flesh. No, no, I'm not going to jump off and tempt God. You don't play with God like that. No. You don't worship somebody other than God. You worship God and him only do you serve. No. This is the Jesus that showed us how to fight. And he expects us to fight, not with carnal weapons, but he expects the world to see a courage in you, the same type of courage that those men and women displayed when they were led out into that Colosseum and looked over at those gates knowing that any moment they were going to be raised and out was going to run a 10-foot lion or a tiger or some other ravenous predator and beast to come and devour them. They knew they were going to die. All they had to do was renounce Christ, and they refused to do it. When you stand, you bring your children in this building every Sunday. Y'all worship together as God's children. You respect each other, your leadership. Brother Burns and others get up and preach the gospel. Men and women sit down and enjoy each other's company, eat together, smile together, laugh together, pray together. You are defeating the devil 
Because he's saying the Christian life is not a good life. And you're saying that's a lie. Christian life is the most wonderful life anywhere. And we prove it every day by our life. I thank God for you. I want you to be strong. And don't you ever give up. And right here in Pulaski, you can start changing America. Right here in this small town, your voice can be heard. Your strength and courage can be formidable. If the small towns and the people who folks think are unimportant lift up their voice again, we are the majority. And if we start standing and saying no, you're not going to do this to us. Watch America change. Watch it happen. God says, if you fight, I'll fight with you. Thank you.